in this uh, session let's look at uh, how do we actually do the hedging using the futures contracts so the key topics which we are going to look at is the basic principles of hedging which we talk about in terms of long hedge versus the short hedge who would prefer a long hedge who would prefer a short hedge is hedging really required and the most important uh, concept in this space the basis risk when does it arise then we also talk about cross hedging especially when we are doing the hedging with some other asset which is not the same as the asset which we need to hedge then how do i use stock index futures for hedging purpose and finally we talk about a strategy called stack and roll strategy right all right we know that futures market there are majorly three kinds of players we have hedgers speculators arbitrages and to a large extent we see hedgers are one of the big set of people who are operating in the futures market and what is their main intention any hedgers intention is to reduce the risk so they are already exposed to some kind of a risk and they want to reduce that particular risk so probably they might be exposed to a fluctuation in the price of the oil and they want to mitigate that or they are an export or an import company who are exposed to foreign exchange rate now that risk they want to reduce or they are exposed to the stock market fluctuation so they wanted to mitigate that so majority of the players who are operating in the futures market as hedgers their intention would be any one of these but their end intention is reduce the risk that they are facing in this context if they are able to reduce it completely if they are able to eliminate that risk completely that is what we are calling as a perfect hedge but unfortunately such a kind of hedge creating is a very very rare phenomena so that is where the challenge lies out of the various hedging opportunities that are possible how do i construct a hedge so that it comes close and closest to the elimination though it's not fully removing to what extent it can reduce my risk that is what comes as a part of this perfect hedging mechanism just to understand some of the basic principles involving hedging the definition is very much clear to all of us a hedge in a hedge we are taking a position that reduces the risk and neutralizes the situation as far as possible when we are saying neutralizing we are either freezing upon the price so even though in the future the price is going to fluctuate by entering into a hedging mechanism i am able to freeze or lock in the price with way at which i am going to buy or sell in the future so that is one thing that we are trying to do as a part so even our profits could be logged in for the future let's let, let's look at this a company knows that it will gain 10000 dollars per each 1 cent increase in the price of the commodity over the next 3 months and lose Ten thousand dollars for each cent decrease in the price. So this is the exposure the company is having. 
right if if the commodities price increases this company is going to gain 10000 bucks if the commodity price decreases by a cent this company is going to lose 10000 bucks now if it wants to mitigate the risk using the futures the treasurer should take a short futures position so he has to go short in the futures market so when he is going short in the futures market again for the same for the worth of 10000 so which means if the if the commodity price increases by a cent this short futures position will lose by 10000 and if this decreases by a cent the short futures position will gain by 10000 now what we see is these two will offset each other if the price of the commodity goes down here there would have been a loss of 10000 bucks but this short position in the futures is creating a gain of 10000 bucks so overall the loss is mitigated but you could argue the other side if this has created a gain of 10000 bucks when the commodity price has gone up this would have created a gain of 10000 bucks but that is neutralized by a loss of 10000 that is occurring in the futures market now the intention here has to be understood that the focus is more on this if the price of the commodity goes down the company is going to lose out heavily we are trying to mitigate against that massive loss that is going to occur so in the process there is some amount of a possibility of a gain that we are foregoing by getting into this hedging process so that's one thing which we have to be very much clear of right if the price of the commodity goes down the gain on the futures position offsets the loss on the rest of the business but if the price of the commodity goes up there is a loss in the futures position that is coming up but that is look at it like that is offset by the gain in the rest of the business so if you look at overall the volatility of your profits is much much lesser now even in the earlier case the loss are is minimal or probably it is almost zero even in the case where the commodity price has gone down also it's uh, very much minimal so which means whether the price of the commodity has gone up or gone down the impact on your overall profits is the same that is what is being achieved by the hedging it's not targeted towards towards generation of some super normal profits so that's one basic principle that we really need to be comfortable with then we try to understand the difference between the two major forms of hedging the short hedge versus the long hedge let's try to understand short hedge is nothing but i take a short position in the futures market long hedge means i am taking a long position in the futures so when i am saying short position in the futures i will be selling an asset think of it like this i will be selling an asset at a future date for the price that we have committed today so that is what we are going to do as a part of the short hedge right we are taking a short position in the futures contract and when are we when is someone going to do that okay let's say i already have an asset with me right i have uh, already i already have uh, a finished product let's say or i already have invested in a portfolio right now my worry is in the future the portfolio value will go down in the future the value of that asset is going to go down may go down 
and if it goes down, that's a loss that I have to bear. So, this is where I'll take the short position in the futures contract. So, appropriate for a hedger who already owns an asset and expects to sell it at some time in future. I don't want to sell it now. So, if I want to sell it now, I can sell it at the current price. But I'm not interested in selling it now, only at a future date. But at the same time, I want, I don't want to sell it at whatever is the price that is available in the future. I want to lock the price because I'm worried that the fluctuation can result in a, a big fall in the price as well. So this is where a short hedge can be used. And at the same time, okay, even I don't own the asset right now. The other situation is I don't own it right now. But somewhere down the lane, I may be purchasing it. Right? Somewhere down the lane, I may be purchasing it. Even in that case, I can very well go for a short hit. Because I would be purchasing it anyhow. So I can uh, sell it uh, 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 in the future at a particular price. So this is one position where uh, I take a short position in the futures market, which is called as a short hedge. But when I am taking a long position, right, uh, it is like, see, these are not speculation positions. I am not expecting that the price will go up or go down, right? I am owning an asset. I want to sell it in the future. It's not a speculative position. Or if not now, I will be owning an asset sometime later, but I want to sell it in the future. So in these both cases, we are calling it as a hedging strategy because I am trying to mitigate my risk of the fluctuation in the price. Again, the same thing, long hedge. See, let's say I want to buy an asset in future. When I am saying, let's say this is a raw material, which is needed for my business. So definitely I want it. But I want to log the price of it. If that's the case, why not uh, buy it today itself? If I buy it today, probably I may incur some kind of inventory costs, some kind of storage costs, which I don't want. Why do I want to get in to take care of it when I don't want it now? And I have to lock my cash flows from today itself. So I'm not interested in buying it today. I need it in the future itself. So when it knows that it has to purchase the asset in the future, but at the same time, it does not want a volatility in the price. It does not want surprises in the price at that particular point in time. In that case, the companies can enter into a long hedging kind of a strategy. So typically long hedge is trying to buy in the futures market. Short hedge is trying to sell in the futures market. Right? Even whether you take the delivery or not, whether you go for a cash settlement or you go for a physical delivery of the underlying asset, this mechanism still remains the same. But the only difference being, the more and more you are going for a delivery, there is a cost associated because uh, the long position is uh, bearing the, deliver, uh, the warehousing related costs. And... Uh, uh, it is expensive because uh, the transportation and various other costs are involved in the delivery. So logically, it is more and more inconvenient. And uh, even when the hedger is keeping the futures contract until the delivery month also, there might be a possibility that the delivery is not made. So delivery is whether you take the delivery or don't take the delivery, the, the impact of the hedging strategy may not change drastically except for additional costs like uh, 
the warehousing and the transportation costs come into picture. And uh, when it comes to the futures market, there is a mark to market that is going to be there. And even when we are evaluating the performance of the hedge, because of this daily settlement, there will be some impact, but it's a very, very negligible impact. But that has to be considered while we are understanding the process. Now, the next important point that comes in our understanding is, do we really need hedging? Is hedging really important? Right? We, we understand a few positives, we look at a few arguments which are in favor of it and some arguments going against it. The first thing we focus on the arguments which are in favor of it. You look at non-financial company, manufacturing, retailing, service providers, all these kind of companies, they have expertise in their core business. Correct? They might be good at manufacturing. They might have implemented extraordinary manufacturing practices, retailing practices. They are very good in the business which they are doing. But they may not have the necessary skills or expertise relating to the market. Are the market variables, interest rates, how the interest rates fluctuate, when are they going to go up, when are they going to go down. These kind of areas, they may not have any kind of skills or expertise. Similarly, exchange rate, they are into export-import business, but they may not be the experts in terms of understanding how the exchange rate is going to move in the next one year. Similarly, the commodity prices, they use the raw materials for manufacturing, but they, are, they may not be uh, good at uh, predicting how the price of the commodity is going to move in the next one year. So, they may be good in the business, core business that they are operating, but they may not have the necessary uh, skills or expertise in those uh, uh, market variables like interest rates, exchange rates, etc. So, this is where they will always think about hedging these risks. So, again as a general fundamental, if at all you don't have the necessary skill or an expertise in a particular variable, better head that risk. And try to focus only on those risks which you think you have the advantage. When I say advantage, you can take the risk and try to generate an additional return. You know how to make additional profit by taking an additional risk. Those kind of risks you take. Any business, if you say that by taking that risk, I know how to generate some additional profits by taking that extra risk. Those kind of risks are worth taking by the corporate companies. Whereas in those areas where they don't have expertise, uh, it's always better to hedge those risks. At least that will help them to be protected against the surprises, sudden surprises that are caused to their business or to their profits because of the fluctuations of these variables. Right? They, they will try to avoid unpleasant surprises which may be like a price rise for the commodity. So these kind of surprises can quite comfortably be avoided. Correct? Now, there are some kind of arguments that come up. So this is uh, more and more in favor of uh, the hedging activity. Why is hedging important? One strong bullet point that goes in that favor is wherever, whichever are the risks, where you don't have the expertise, where you don't know how to deal with them, it's better to hedge those risks and take only those risks which you can really handle 
and and uh, have a plan in place to take advantage of the risk to generate additional profits or returns for your business but let's look at some arguments that go against it so one major dimension that comes is from the perspective of the shareholders now there is an argument that always says why should a company do the hedging can't the shareholder do the hedging himself can't the shareholder diversify yes shareholders do a diversification so they will uh, buy the shares of company x and at the same time they will buy the shares of company y which might be the might be the vendor for x and they will also try to hold the shares of z which is the key customer of x might very well be possible right uh, so they may plan it out very well they may do a diversification so a shareholder can try to spread the risk reduce the risk and try to hedge the whole stuff that's an argument that can be brought out but a few things we really need to understand in this kind of an argument there is a very strong assumption that is coming up that the shareholder has as much information as a company's management regarding the risk so shareholder is aware of all the kind of risk that the company is facing which really need not be true very rarely it is true company has much much wider information compared to the shareholders regarding the risk that the company is facing so that argument unless i assume that both of them have the same amount of information all the shareholders i am not talking about one of them all the shareholders have a similar kind of an information and know how to act in a similar way when they are facing this kind of risk that's a kind of an assumption that is being made and at the same time this argument ignores the commissions transaction costs etc here we have to understand why i brought in is uh, brought in this is typically when you do a small deal which uh, every individual shareholder separately if they are doing they are all smaller deals in smaller deals typically the commissions and transaction costs are much higher whereas if the company does a deal in one single shot because of uh, being a large deal large transaction the it becomes less expensive so that less expensive the cost being lesser gives rise to a higher profit so the mere size of the futures contract the other side to look at see there is a lot size that goes as a part of the futures contract now this size itself makes it difficult for the individual shareholders only if it is executed as a lump sum it becomes more and more beneficial sometimes the the lot size may not be sufficient for every individual investor to execute it so there are some limitation so theoretically yes i can say shareholders can do the hedging themselves by better diversification probably with the vendor buying the shares of the vendors the customers of uh, of a particular company but the reality is all these things can very much crop up so wherever if i try to understand if the company is acting in the best interest of the well diversified shareholders it's like all the shareholders are equally knowledgeable they have maintained a well diversified portfolio if you think from those kind of statement yes then i can argue that hedging is really unnecessary every shareholder has a good amount of information he has created a well diversified portfolio altogether everyone has created a well diversified portfolio in that case i can very clearly say that hedging may be unnecessary but these are all very rare to happen so which means the companies do get into 
a typical hatching process. Then, another argument that comes out against the hedging is from the competitor's perspective. Yeah, this is an interesting story. If hedging is a norm in the industry, if all my competitors are hedging, then it's good for me to hedge. If my competitors are not hedging, there is no incentive for me to hedge. Let me talk about something like this. See, hedging is for fixing the volatility, for reducing the volatility in the price, right, in the profits. Now, let's say there is an industry where the costs are going down. Our costs are going up. If the cost of the raw materials is going up, if uh, the company has a flexibility to increase the price, if the company has flexibility to increase the price, and similarly, if the costs are going down, the company can immediately decrease the price because of the competitive pressure. If this is the kind of situation, where you have the flexibility to increase the price or decrease the price depending on the cost of your input. In that kind of a situation, it says there is no need to hedge because you have the flexibility to play around with your price as well. So you can pass on the risk to your customer. In that case, there is no need to hedge. If you hedge it, you are actually now, uh, if you are hedging it, you are bringing in more volatility to your profits. Correct? Instead, if you are not hedged, okay, this is, see, if you have seen, let's say the prices and costs have gone up. And because of the hedging, you have fixed the cost. Now, your price, uh, your uh, price is much higher. So, you would have gained a very high profit. But let's say if the cost of the commodity has gone down, but still you are paying this much because you have had the cost of this commodity. So though it has gone down, you are still paying this much. But if your uh, prices have gone down, your profits have gone very low. So there's a lot of volatility in your profit because of getting into this hedging. Either you may generate a very high profit or a very low profit because of the hedging. So, that's where we say, don't be an odd one out. If hedging is not the norm in the industry, then don't get into the hedging process. No need to be odd one out. And this is very much applicable. If the prices of the goods and services fluctuate, I have the flexibility in terms of increasing the price or decreasing the price based on the input costs. Raw material cost going up, typically for a gold. If the cost of gold is going up, I can increase the price of the gold ornament. Similarly, if the cost of the gold is going down, the gold shops, the jewelry shops, they decrease the price of the uh, gold instrument. So, the price can be fluctuated to reflect all the internal costs, raw materials, interest rates, exchange rates. Then, if the price is fluctuating always to reflect the cost, it's always ideal not to go ahead with the hedging process. Right? Company that does not hedge is more or less stabilizing its profit compared to a company which has got into the hedging. So the moral of the story here is look at the big picture when you are doing the hedging. It's not that hedging is required always. All the implications of the price changes, can I change the price if my input costs are changing? To what extent they impact the company's profitability, they have to be understood thoroughly before designing a hedging strategy to protect against any kind of price changes. And one more dimension where the argument goes against the hedging is, it need not be the case that hedging is always profitable. In some cases, it can result in a very worst outcome as well. 
in some cases you will end up into a big loss which would have been possible if you have not got into a hedging strategy so this is where the understanding has to come hedging is not a measure to increase the profit hedging is a measure to protect the downside in case there has been a loss in case there is a possibility of a loss hedging is trying to protect the organization from that kind of a loss severe loss that is going to occur the re- the same thing let's say i have an asset i am uh, uh, let's say i already have uh, an asset worth uh, 10000 so i have taken a short position in the futures market for that same 10000 so if uh, if there is an increase in the underlying this portfolio is gaining 10000 the short position is going to lose 10000 whereas if there is a loss here if there is a down here the portfolio is going to lose 10000 and uh, it the same would be compensated by the short position in the futures now if this has occurred right if this has occurred wherein uh, there is a uh, there is a drop in the price obviously the strategy that has been designed by the treasurer would be appreciated across the company because company would have lost 10000 but because of the hedging strategy it has neutralized that and the loss has come to zero whereas if this has occurred wherein the company would have made a gain of 10000 but because of the hedging strategy that it has got in the gain is becoming zero now in this situation it's very very hard and difficult to justify why the hedging strategy has been implemented right the intention is in both the cases the profit or loss is close to zero so the objective of that hedging is always to reduce the risk in some cases if things have gone if things have not gone well on your underlying asset then probably hedging has protected you from that but if things have gone positively then the hedging strategy is resulting in a loss compared to the situation if you have not hedged so this is one point where the entire organization should be on the same line so we have to understand that the hedging can result in a decrease or an increase in the company's profit compared to if it has not hedged if the if the outcome on uh, the original underlying asset is negative then hedging is generating profits for the company but if the outcome on the original underlying is positive then hedging is actually worsening the profitability of the company so this is where the treasurer has to be very much comfortable he has to make everyone understand what is the importance of the hedging and this is where we talk about any hedging strategy that is implemented it has to be ensured that all the senior management understand the nature of hedging hedging so it has to be uh, the strategies are always designed by the board of directors and they are communicated well across all the layers in the organization so here we really need to understand that there are some uh, positives as well as demerits that are associated with going ahead with hedging so there has to be a good understanding before a detailed hedging strategy can be designed for the same now we understand we'll try to uh, understand a few conceptual aspects here basis risk in many a cases whatever the hedging that we are performing it is it need not be a straight forward process when i am talking about need not be a straight forward okay i have a portfolio right this is my asset now this asset i am expecting that the price of this asset can either go down in the future right my risk is when it goes down 
So I want to hedge this particular risk. So if you see in the futures, so I want to let's say use the futures market to hedge this risk. It may be very much possible that this asset may not be available in the futures market. Right? This asset, this, is, this may be a portfolio of various stocks in various proportion. So exactly the same may not be available in the futures market. So that is what we are saying. The asset whose price is to be hedged. So this asset may not be exactly same as the asset that is acting as an underlying in the futures market. This could be a portfolio of various stocks. Or here probably I would have used index futures. So this may not be an exact reflection of the index here, my portfolio here. Or probably I have lots and lots of uh, jet fuel. Right? I want to sell jet fuel. But jet fuel futures are not there. I am expecting that jet fuel prices may go down in the future or whatever. I want to protect myself against the fluctuation in the price of the jet fuel. But I have seen that uh, in, the, in the futures market, jet fuel futures are not that heavy. They don't have that much of volume for jet fuel futures. But heating oil futures are very, very much liquid. So, which means sometimes depending on the kind of asset that is available in the futures market, I may try to choose the closest one, right? That is one thing. So, which means the hedging is not straightforward. Then, the uncertainty regarding the date, when the asset will be bought or sold. I don't know when I will uh, sell this jet fuel. I don't know when I will sell this portfolio. So, if I don't know the timing, when I am going to sell this asset, or when I am going to buy a new asset exact time, how do I identify at what futures contract do I need to get into? What time of the, what delivery month do I need to get into? So that is where the uncertainty comes. And many a times it may so happen, we have already discussed that the futures contracts have to be closed much, much before the delivery month as well. So, so in all these cases, the hedging process is not straightforward. And in all these cases, what comes out is the basis risk. That is what we are calling as a basis risk. So just to understand it, first let's understand the basis. Spot price minus the futures price. Whatever is the asset that I am using for hedging purpose, the, this particular portfolio. So I will take the spot price of this portfolio or I will take the spot price of this jet fuel minus the futures price of whatever I am using for the hedging purpose. That is what we are calling as a basis. Now, if both of them are exactly the same, now let us look at the situation. Both of them are exactly, let us assume that I am hedging it with the jet fuel futures itself. So, both the assets are exactly the same. In that case, on the expiration date, the basis should be zero because there is nothing called futures price. So the difference between these two should be exactly zero. But much before the expiration, it may be either positive or negative because it may so happen. The spot price could be higher now, but after a certain point, we are expecting that at the expiration, the futures price should converge to a spot price. So it might very well happen that the spot price could be either above the futures price or below the futures price, which means the basis could either be positive or negative as long as the asset is the same. As the time passes, we are coming closer and closer to maturity. We see that the spot price and the futures price are going to converge. Now, if the gap is, if the spot price minus the futures price, if it is increasing, 
This is what we call as strengthening of the basis. So, which means either the spot price is increasing or the futures price is decreasing. So, this is what we are calling as the basis, uh, strengthening of the basis. If this decrease, if this gap is decreasing, we are calling as the weakening of the basis. As the time is passing on, the difference between the spot and the futures price, it is not changing at the same rate. Probably either, uh, either it is increasing or decreasing. So that is where we are using the words like strengthening of the basis and weakening of the basis. And that basis, whatever is changing, fluctuating basis, there is a lot of uncertainty with that difference as well. Especially when I am having, when I am, when the asset is a totally different one, I am hedging jet fuel futures, jet fuel with heating oil futures. It might be very much, both of them may be very much different in the price. Both of them may be changing very much differently in their overall movement. In that kind of a case, it is very, very difficult for the basis to be same across. And that, uh, that volatility of the basis is what we are calling as a basis risk. So, in some cases, the change in the basis either can improve the position of the hedger, in some cases it can worsen. Let us look at it. Someone has got into a short hedge. Right? Okay. Let us say we are thinking of someone who have got into a short hedge. So, he is already having the portfolio. Right? This is what is a short hedge. He is already having a portfolio. He has... He has uh, agreed to sell this portfolio uh, in the futures market at a particular price. Now, look at basis as strengthened unexpectedly. Means, the, sh the, the spot price of the portfolio, the spot price of the portfolio has actually gone up. Right? And let us assume that the futures price has actually gone down. Now, what is happening? One, the spot price of the portfolio has gone up. Right? Either if this has gone down or not gone down, let us come back to it. The gap has widened. So, literally, if I am just looking at it theoretically, it would have happened that I, this would have gone up or this would have gone down. So, if this has gone up, there is a gain for the position. Assume that this did not go up, but this has fallen. Uh, in, in the, if there is a fall in the futures price, the short is gaining. So, even that is a gain. And if both have happened, even that is a gain. So, overall it is looking like if the person has got into a short hedge and the basis has strengthened, we see that the company position is improving. Because in the spot market, the assets value has actually gone up. And uh, uh, typically, if it has resulted in the futures price going down, even a fall in the futures price is resulting in a gain for a short position. But if we are talking of the long, if the so in this case, if the basis has weakened, there would have been a loss. Now here, for the short hedge versus the long hedge, and here we will take basis being strengthening, and the base is weakening. Let us say we have this kind of a combination. If the basis is strengthening, the short is going to gain. If the basis is weakening, the short is going to lose. Similarly here, if the short is, if the, if the basis is strengthening, the long is going to lose and the short is going to gain. So this is the combination or a grid that we really need to be comfortable with. Then we have already uh, talked about the cross hedging, especially the asset that I want to hedge is not the same as the asset that I am using as underlying for the futures contract to hedge. So if these two are different, even more basis risk is possible. 
because it might so be happening that on the maturity date also these two prices may not converge because these are two different assets altogether so it might very well be possible that these two assets may not converge at all so the basis risk can be even more higher in this case right now a few more things that are going to impact the basis risk the choice of the contract now when i am saying in the choice of the contract there are two things one the asset we have already talked about very rare to get a perfect asset right i want to hedge my portfolio it's very rare that i get the exact portfolio futures available in the market i want to hedge jet fuel very rare to get jet fuel futures with a good amount of liquidity available in the market so if that is not possible there is a heavy amount of analysis that has to go in determining out of the various available futures contracts which of them is having more and more similarity to the price of the asset that i want to hedge which one is having more and more similarity in terms of the price movement with respect to the jet fuel so i have to spend some time in terms of researching which of these is a best alternative that's one thing second the choice of the delivery month plays an important role right especially people try to choose a later month why a later month there is always when we observe the futures markets there is always a, a possibility that the futures prices are quite erratic during the delivery month more and more volatile during the delivery month so it might very well be a possible if there is a good amount of liquidity people may prefer a later month contracts and at the same time if i am going for that delivery month futures itself let's say as a long position there is a possibility at least in some cases that i may end up i may be forced to go in for a delivery because i would be one of the oldest i would be one of the uh, having old one of the oldest uh, outstanding position and uh, i may be going i may have to go for a force in delivery if the contract is held until the delivery month which will become expensive and inconvenient so i may want to close out the position even before the delivery month itself so these things play an important role in terms of affecting the basis risk time difference between the hedge expiration and the delivery month so now i want to i want to hedge let's say up to december 2015 right and now the delivery month is only september 2015 still the basis risk is could be higher or even if i want to hedge up to december 2015 and the delivery month i got for march 2016 even in this case i see that the basis risk could be higher so the more and more is the gap between the two either positive or negative it is definitely going to increase the basis risk so for that from that purpose it's always advised that you choose a delivery month as close as possible see uh, depend to your hedge so the let's say december 2015 is the closest period of your hedge choose the delivery month as close as possible but immediately later than the expiration of the hedge so probably if there is a january 2016 futures just look at january 2016 futures if you want to hedge your asset until december 2015 but here we are assuming that in all the futures the liquidity is sufficiently available but i mean there is a huge, there is a decent market for buying and selling frequently but the reality is the liquidity is uh, much much higher for shorter term 
futures contracts compared to a longer term. So all these things really need to be taken into consideration. But what we are saying is basis risk could be impacted because of these features as well. Now, let's try to understand the concept of cross hedging in much more detail. And how do we plan our hedging strategy in case of cross hedging? We have already discussed that the asset that is underlying the futures contract is different from the asset that I really want to hedge. Like I have been using this example, I will use the heating oil future contract to hedge the exposure to jet fuel. Now, this is where we will introduce a term called hedge ratio, which talks about what is the size of the position you take in the futures contract to the size of exposure. Now, if, you're, uh, if you want to hedge your portfolio worth 10,000 bucks, what is the size of the position you take in the futures market? Do you take the position for 10,000? Do you, uh, do you take the position, do you take the position for uh, 5,000 or do you take it for 20,000, right? So this is what the size of the position that you take in the futures contract because these two assets are different now. When both of them are the same, probably the hedge ratio is always one. When both of them are always the same, when the asset that is underlying is same as the asset that you are using for hedging, you will always find that the hedge ratio is 1. But the more and more we are getting into a cross hedging, it is very, very difficult to get a hedge ratio 1 and even if I said hedge ratio equal to 1, it may not be optimal. Now, this is where my intention is to mitigate, to minimize the variance of the value of the hedged position. Look at it like this. Okay, let me assume that this is the spot price, S is the spot price, F is the forward price, the future spread. And delta S is the daily change or is the change in the spot the change in the futures. Now, all I really want is, I want to minimize this basis risk. So, which means I want to take out the variance of delta S minus delta F. Now, if you see, I want to hedge this particular difference Right, the, the spot price has changed by delta S and the futures price of whatever the underlying that I have used, that has changed by delta F. But I want to use this futures to mitigate this risk. So let us assume that I want hedge such kind of futures so that this delta S is more or less equivalent to hedge times delta F. Now this is where I say my mitigation strategy should be, I want to mitigate the variance of delta S minus H times delta F. I want to mitigate. Now, what would be the variance of this like? So, it is like variance of delta S plus H square times variance of delta F minus 2H times covariance between delta S and delta F, right? This is the typical, uh, uh, this is the typical expansion that is going to come out. And now I want to, uh, I want to uh, mitigate this, find the derivative of this with respect to H. So, because I want this variance, so the, the variance has to be minimum. So, I will take the first derivative of it with respect to h and I will set it equal to 0. So, it becomes 2h times variance of delta f 
minus 2 covariance delta s delta f. This is equal to 0. So, from here you are getting h is nothing but 2 times the covariance between delta s delta f divided by the variance of delta f. Now, this is what is your optimal edge ratio and we know that covariance you can very well write it as correlation times the standard deviation of uh, delta s and standard deviation of delta f divided by variance of delta f we will write it as standard deviation of delta f square so it works out as correlation times delta s the standard deviation of s divided by the standard deviation of f. Now, this is what your optimal edge ratio. Either you look at it, uh, sorry, this 2 does not exist, covariance between uh, delta s and delta f divided by the variance of delta f. If you try to remember this, this is nothing but the beta. Beta with respect to delta f. Right, so, so even you can uh, use it as beta with respect to uh, delta f or you can uh, use it with, res with this kind of a formula, correlation times sigma, uh, the, the, the standard deviation of the spot price divided by the standard deviation of the futures price. Okay, so I should not set it equal to 1. So, I should always uh, look at setting the hedge ratio equal to something around this. So, this is so that's where we are saying this is the slope of the best fitting line when you try to regress delta S against delta F. Right? So, delta F being your uh, independent variable, delta S is your dependent variable when you perform this regression, whatever is the slope that is going to come up. That is what we are calling as the minimum variance hedge ratio. If the correlation is 1 and delta F equal to delta S, we are seeing hedge ratio is 1. But similarly, if the correlation is 1, delta S is twice that of delta F, then hedge ratio is 0.5. So, it is just a matter of substituting to typically get your optimal edge ratio. Okay, let us look at uh, one numerical regarding this optimal hedge ratio. Standard deviation of the quarterly changes in the price of the commodity is 0.65. Price of the commodity. So, this is uh, the spot prices is 0.65. Standard deviation of the quarterly changes in the future price on the commodity is 0.81. Coefficient of correlation is around 0.8. Now, you just need to find the optimal hedge ratio. Now, you have the formula. The optimal hedge ratio is nothing but the correlation times the standard deviation of the spot price divided by the standard deviation of the futures. So, this will give you your optimal hedge ratio. Fine. Then, one more aspect. Here, I really... One, knowing the optimal hedge ratio is pretty much fine. But at the same time, I really want to know what should be the optimal number of contracts that I really need to get into. Should I take the long position in the contract? Should I take a short position in the contract? And how many contracts is what I really need to get into? So that's one more thing that is left for us. Now, this is where we are looking at first understanding the hedge effectiveness, right, which comes out through our R squared. In the earlier case, whatever we have done, we got the correlation. The square of the correlation talks about the hedge effectiveness. To what extent the price of the, the, price, uh, of the asset is being uh, hedged with the futures contract that has been chosen. So, it is a proportion of variance that is eliminated by hedging. So, the higher it is, to a large extent, the hedge is becoming more and more effective. The more closer this value is to 1, 
we can talk about the hedge being more and more effective. The more away from it, the hedge is not that effective. Probably in the earlier example, if we are seeing 0.8 correlation. So R squared is around 64%. So that much of variance is eliminated by the hedge means the remaining 36% variance is still present in a particular hedge. Right? It's coming from that R squared. Now, in general, the moment I have a data, the historical data, so let's uh, take some data and based on that, let's try to uh, construct, uh, try to understand this uh, situation by using a spreadsheet of data. Okay, now let's uh, look at this uh, data set. I am more interested in a crude oil, crude palm oil futures contract. Let me take one example. The crude palm oil, which is listed on NCDX exchange of India. Now for this, uh, on this, I am looking at the June 2015 crude palm oil futures. Right? For simplicity here, I would like to look at the spot prices of the palm oil right from 2nd March 2015. I have taken it until the 15th June 2015. Similarly, that particular futures I have taken from the 2nd March 2015 till 15th June 2015. Here, I would like to look at the basis. By what extent the difference between the two is changing. Now, you could see the difference if I am taking the spot minus the futures on that particular day, it's around minus 12 point. So, in some cases, it has become minus 10, minus 12, minus 11, minus 5. Even it is a situation of minus 1. So, there has been a lot of volatility between the spot and the futures. Correct? Now, if I really want to find out what is an optimal hedge ratio, this, according to this kind of, a, according to this formula which we have uh, discussed out here, I need the standard deviation of the spot. You could see here the standard deviation of the quarterly changes in the future price of the commodity versus the quarterly uh, changes in the price of the commodity. So, I will take the changes. So, I will take the spot changes. So, I will take this. Uh, this is delta S. This minus this. So, this is the spot change. Spot has fallen by 4.2 bucks. Spot has gone up by 0.3. So, that is a spot change. Now, similarly, I will talk about the futures change. Even this, I look at it as this minus this. So, on this day, the futures has actually have fallen by 4.1. Here there is a here there is a fall by 0.1, whereas the spot has actually increased by 0.3. So this is what is the change in the futures, which is what delta F, and this is delta S. Now what is that we are saying? I really need to find out the correlation and the standard deviation. So I'll take the standard deviation of the spot changes which is working out to, I will take the standard deviation of the spot changes, which is coming out to 2.899. I will take the standard deviation of the futures change, which is coming out to around 3.4. So, the futures is slightly more volatile compared to that of the spot. And at the same time, I will also look at the correlation between the spot changes and the futures changes. So, correlation between the spot changes and the futures changes is coming out to be around 0.86. So, because this is the same asset, I see a very high correlation that is existing between the changes of both of them. But just to work it out, if I am really uh, looking at 
the optimal hedge ratio from this particular. All we are talking of is correlation multiplied by the standard deviation of the spot, right? Multiplied by the standard deviation of the spot and we are dividing it by the standard deviation of the futures. So it says 0.73 is the optimal hedge ratio. So if I have to hedge one unit, one dollar of the volatility, then it's better that I get into the 0.73 units of the hedging. So that is what is coming out as my hedge ratio. So if I traditionally, now if I have to extend the same, let's say I have $1,000 of risk to be hedged, right? $1,000 of risk to be hedged. And let's say each future contract is worth $10. Then what it says is, okay, $1,000 of the uh, risk to be hedged. So let me uh, take it as, so here we are talking of each contract being 10. So $1,000 to be hedged and the hedge ratio is 0.73 divided by each futures position is $10. So the number of hedges that I typically number of uh, contracts that I will go for, number of short positions that I will go for, for this, for hedging this uh, portfolio is around 73 contracts on a short basis. So that's how we compute using this cross hedging kind of a mechanism. Whatever is the hedging, I'll first find out the optimal hedge ratio through this mechanism. I'll find the standard deviation of the spot, standard deviation of the futures, correlation between the two and from there I get the optimal hedge ratio and once I get the optimal hedge ratio I multiply it with the size of the position that requires to be hedged divided by the size of one futures contract. Let's take one more example. An airline expects to purchase 2 million gallons of jet fuel in one month. So the size of the position that it wants to hedge is 2 million and decides to use heating oil futures. So we got sigma F, sigma S and correlation. Each heating oil contract traded by the CME group is on 42,000 gallons of. So here it is talking about 2 million gallons and each contract is around 42 gallons of heating oil. Now for this example, if I really want to find out the hedge ratio, First of all, the QA, the quantity of the asset that needs to be hedged is 2 million. This is 2 million. I am looking at uh, the, the, the quantity that is uh, available for the futures contract for one unit is 42,000. Then I have the standard deviation of the futures price coming out to 0 0.0313. I'm having the standard deviation of the spot, which is 0 0.0263. And I'm also having the correlation as 0.928. So based on this, I'll first get optimal hedge ratio, which comes out to correlation times the standard deviation of the spot divided by the standard deviation of the futures working out to 0.77. And from here, I need to find out the number of uh, contracts which comes out as my optimal hedge ratio multiplied by the quantity of asset that needs to be held divided by the quantity that is associated with one contract of the futures. So it says that I should go short on 37 right it expects to purchase so because it wants to buy it here it can uh, go for uh, the short uh, uh, the shorting 37.13 units it can typically short so that that's the typical uh, way out uh, in terms of computing the number of units number of units of the contract to really get into now in reality Okay, here we did not, by, by doing this kind of an exercise where I have taken the daily spot changes, 
and based on that uh, found out the standard deviations and all this works pretty much fine if i am looking at it as a forward contract not as a future uh, futures contract right if there is a daily settlement see generally when we talk about the futures we are looking at it as a daily settlement and a series of one day hedges so probably taking this uh, absolute change in the spot prices may not work very effectively because it's a new contract every day if this has been in the forward probably this approach would have been much much better but in case of futures because we are getting into a new contract every day you know, the, the price the base is changing every day so that is where we always prefer doing it on a percentage change basis instead of dollar change i would look at it as the spot percentage change and i would also look at futures percentage change which will come out let's say i am taking it as a on a continuous basis if i am taking the logarithm of this divided by this will give you me a percentage change in the spot price okay i look at it as the instead of a dollar change i am looking at it as a percentage change in the spot along with that i am also looking at a percentage change in the futures as well especially with the futures contract where there is a possibility of where there is a daily settlement so in this daily settlement scenarios i am looking at not the absolute changes but the percentage changes both in the spot as well as the futures now based on this i am actually looking at uh, the uh, the spot standard deviation for the percentage change so if i look at it i get a slightly different number altogether okay this is the spot percentage change and even when i am looking at the futures the percentage change my standard deviation is going to look like 0.007 still it looks like the futures is more volatile compared to the spot and i look at the correlation between the percentage change in the spot versus the futures okay this is the percentage again more or less the same now this is where we talk about when the futures are settled on a daily basis instead of taking the absolute we are trying to find out the correlation between the percentage one day changes these are the percentage one day changes that we have computed both for the futures as well as the spot price and based on that i am getting a one day hedge ratio as the standard deviation i'm 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 actually converting it into an amount by taking the current spot price and the current futures price so probably if i have to find out the optimal hedge ratio now what i'll do is i'll take this correlation multiply it with the standard deviation of the percentage here no issues but that i am multiplying it with the current spot price i multiply it with the current spot price and in the denominator i'll take the current futures price multiply it with the one day volatility of the futures so instead of taking directly uh, the spot price in absolute terms we are uh, taking it in a percentage term and we are trying to adjust it with the current spot price and the future price now this gives me that the optimal hedge ratio is around 0.74 earlier we have got it as around 0.73 now it is 0.74 especially uh, this is the minor change that can typically come into picture and of course number of contracts that we really need to hedge look at the overall hedge position remaining things uh, up to here is your hedge ratio whatever we have computed right this is your hedge ratio whatever we have computed look at uh, the the quantity that we need to hedge divided by the quantity that is available for hedging so it's only that this is helpful for us on a regular basis on a daily basis this percentage change i'll have this values change 
my yes my current spot price will change future price will change based on that i'll try to compute what is the change in the optimal hedge ratio based on that i'll see uh, whether i need to close some of the existing contracts or i need to reopen some of the new contracts we should literally speaking we should change the futures position every day to reflect the latest values of the value of the asset as well as the value of the futures contract but of course if i keep on changing it on a regular basis there are transaction costs and everything else involved now this procedure where we are trying to compute the optimal hedge ratio every day by looking at the one day hedge ratio and trying to uh, find out uh, the number of contracts to be uh, either uh, shorted or longed on a daily basis is what we are calling as the tailing the hedge as a concept now we'll move on uh, to the next aspect wherein if at all i want to use stock index futures we know that uh, future contracts especially stock index based futures they are not for any kind of delivery they are purely cash setted and uh, we have already discussed that all the contracts are mark to market based on the opening price or the closing price of index on the last trading day and that is where all the positions are treated as closed now when do we use stock index futures if i already have a well diversified equity portfolio where i may think that this portfolio is a good reflection of the entire equity market then probably i can mitigate the risk of that particular portfolio using the stock index futures so if the portfolio is more or less reflecting the index in that case the hedge ratio is one now if you remember when we have computed the hedge ratio we have uh, actually got it as correlation times the standard deviation of the spot by standard deviation of the futures or the same thing we have got it as the covariance between the spot and the futures divided by the variance of the futures now which is nothing but the beta itself going with the capital asset pricing model this is the beta itself and uh, probably if i am looking at this f if i look at this f as the index index futures it is like a covariance between the portfolio's returns and the index returns divided by the variance of the index returns which is a perfect definition of the beta itself so this is where uh, we can directly use the hedge ratio as the beta itself number of future contracts that should be shorted in this example would be direct va by vf because hedge ratio is 1 but when the portfolio does not mirror we are trying to look at the optimal hedge ratio as directly the beta itself because it's nothing but it's the formula of the hedge ratio so beta is what we are using so beta is the one that is coming as the slope of the best fit regression line when i am when i am uh, going with uh, delta s here which is the excess return of the portfolio over the excess return of the index over the risk free rate so once i get that beta that beta is what we are typically uh, using instead of uh, uh, instead of the optimal hedge ratio we are using the beta to find out the optimal number of contracts so everything else remains the same suppose the futures contract with 4 months to maturity is used to hedge the value of the portfolio over the next 3 months one future contract is for a delivery of 250 times the index value of the snp index okay it's uh, 1000 right let's uh, look at this numerical okay value of the snp index is 1000 snp 500 futures it is around 1010 
which is for 3 months. So, the time period is 0.25 years approximately. And value of the portfolio is 50-50-000. Risk free rate 4% per annum. 4% per annum working out to 1% per 3 months. Dividend yield on the index. We are saying 1% per annum. So probably let me take it as 0.25% per the period. Beta of the portfolio is coming out to 1.5. And futures is for the delivery of 250 times the index. So the multiplier is around 250 times the index. Okay. Fair enough. Now. First of all, I really need to know what is my optimal hedge ratio. Let me compute that. So, if I really uh, require, okay, uh, yeah, let's uh, talk about the optimal hedge ratio here, which goes as beta times the value that I am really requiring to hedge, which is the value of the portfolio. Right, this is what I wanted to hedge. So beta is 1.5 beta times the value that value of the portfolio that I want to hedge divided by the value of one futures. So this is for one one future is means a delivery of 250 times that of the index. So the value of one contract is this much. So the optimal number of contracts. Right, it's not the hedge ratio. Hedge ratio is nothing but the beta. So, optimal number of contracts that I have to get in to hedge this portfolio came out to 30. Right. Now, if it turns out that the index turns to be 900 in 3 months and futures price is 902, find the gain from the short futures position. Okay, now the futures price came to 902. So, because I have got into a short futures, a fall in the futures price is going to be a gain. So, the gain is going to be uh, on, on one single future, the uh, short futures position, gain on single future because the futures price has dropped. Gain on a single future is going to be okay the the uh, uh, later point future price later is around 902 so the gain on single future is going to be 1010 minus 902 so resulting in on one single futures this is the gain that i have got right uh, this is the gain that i have got and this has to be multiplied by 250 as well because one contract is for the delivery of two, uh, 250 times. So, on one single future, this is what I have gained. Gain, total futures gain. The futures gain that I have got is this multiplied by the number of contracts that I have gotten. So, in the futures contract, I have a gain of 810,000. Okay, fair enough. Now, what about the spot? So, the spot later... Now, spot price later, it has fallen to 900. So, let's see now, the fall in spot or spot returns, let me call it, spot returns, which is the index. Spot returns on the index, it has fallen from 1000 to 900. So, there is, a, there is a fall of 10%. But of course, during this process, there is a gain, there is a dividend that has been received. We assume that this is uniformly spread. So, there could be a dividend that could be received to the extent of 0.25%. So, the overall market RM is around minus 9.75. 
right? RM is going to be minus 9.75. Risk free is around 1%. Beta is there. So probably I'll expect the portfolio returns going with that concept, which goes with our CAPM, capital asset pricing model, RF plus beta times RM minus RF which is working out to my portfolio returns to be somewhere around minus 0.15 which means I am expecting that my portfolio will drop in value by this much. So expected portfolio value here is going to be this out of this I am expecting a drop of this much. So I am expecting my value of the portfolio to be this. So overall, I am looking at the hedger's position, which includes the value of the portfolio along with a gain in the futures, taking the overall value of the portfolio to around 5,096,000. 5, 5, 5, so the overall gain in the portfolio is from 50-50, it has gone to 50.96. So the gain, it has resulted in a gain of around, around only 0.91% for this three month period, which is again lesser than even your risk free rate of, uh, or which is uh, much lesser than a risk free rate of return as well. So in this case, even the hedge did not give any better kind of a return. But in some cases, it may work in a slightly different way as well. If that's the case, why do we really think of hedging an equity portfolio? Now, this is where we talk about this concept of hedging is really justified if the hedger is really a very strongly feeling that the stocks are selected very well. So he, does, he is not, uh, he is uncertain about the performance of the market as a whole. Market may go down. So he is worried about the performance of the market as a whole. But whichever the stocks he has chosen in this, they are expected to perform better than the market. It's not that they are going to give him the returns, extraordinary returns. But he is expecting, compared to the market performance, these stocks which he is selecting are expected to go up, are expected to perform better. So, when the market as a whole is going down, he wants a protection against the market as a whole. Now, in our earlier case, the market has dropped drastically, portfolio value has dropped drastically. Now, this is where his hedge is becoming more and more important. So the hedger, he is uncertain about the overall performance of the market, but he is very confident that the stocks which he has chosen in the portfolio will be better than the market, will outperform the market. So by doing the hedging, using the index futures, he is trying to remove the impact of the index overall market movement which means the exposure that he is left with is only relating to the stocks that are there as a part of the portfolio. And that is what his core business is. He, he has chosen the uh, uh, stocks very, very carefully. So he is very good at it. He is ready to take the risk because he is expecting a higher return on them. Now, this is what is the motivation behind using equity uh, stock index uh, futures for hedging your equity portfolio. Or in another way, if I have to look at, okay, hedger is having a portfolio, but he does not want to sell it right away. He wants to have it for a longer term. But in the short term, he is expecting a big fall in the portfolio and he does not want the values to be going down. So he wants a short term protection against the uncertainty that is going to be there rather than selling it and buying it back, which could very much result in a huge amount of transaction costs and uh, probably uh, may not be a better solution. He may think of uh, using a short term futures contract, short position 
to typically uh, get an advantage of this uh, small period uncertain move without really disturbing the composition of the portfolio at all. So these are different uh, reasons why people may still get into the hedging of the equity portfolio with the index futures. Now, in the earlier example, when I've uh, talked about the beta being, uh, I mean, beta times the value of the asset to be hedged by the value of the futures contract, here our intention was to eliminate the beta altogether. By getting into these many uh, contracts, I am making it beta neutral. The net is becoming beta equal to zero. But in many a cases, I am not interested in going into zero risk kind of a position, but I want to reduce my risk to some extent. I am still interested in having some amount of beta. Let's say initially my beta was 0.5, but I am really okay having a beta of 0.5 because that is a kind of a calculated risk that can help me out. So if that is the case, I'll have a different number of contracts to short. Right. If, if it is uh, the entire beta to be eliminated, then we said that the number of contracts to be a uh, uh, number of future contracts that we really need to get in is this much. But if I want to reduce it to some beta cap, then all we are saying is take it as beta minus beta star times BA by BF. If you look at it like this, a company has 20 million portfolio beta of 1.2. Use the future. So beta of 1.2 itself is a meaning that it is with respect to the index. So that's where the beta is directly coming into picture. Okay, 20 million portfolio beta of 1.2. It would like to use futures contracts on a stock index to hedge its risk. Index futures is currently at 1080 delivery of 250 times the index. What is the hedge that minimizes the risk? So what is the head that minimizes the risk? Obviously, I have the beta 1.2 times the value to be hedged, which is 20 million. Right, the value to be hedged is around 20 million divided by the futures is 1080 and each contract is for delivery of 250 times the index. So this should be the appropriate number of future contracts that need to be shorted. In case the beta has to be completely eliminated, minimize the risk. What should the company do if it wants to reduce the beta of the portfolio just to 0.6? Then instead of taking 1.2 here, take only 0.6, which is 1.2 minus 0.6, reducing it from 1.2 to 0.6. So take it as 0.6 times this, those many positions need to be shorted, a straightforward one. Then, sometimes it could very well happen that I want to hedge my position, let's say, until December 2016, right? But in the futures contracts, I have only up to, let's say, September 2015. Only three months futures contract is available. What should I do? This is a scenario which is very common. Many a time the expiration date of the hedge is much later than the delivery date of all the futures contracts that could be used. I don't have a futures contract beyond September 2015. If that's the case, it means close the hedge here you open it, you open a fresh contract, let's say up for December 15. Again, close it here, open it for March 2016. So you are closing the existing contract and you are reopening a, a fresh contract. So that is what we are calling it as stack and roll. We are rolling the hedge to the, to the future date by closing out the futures contract existing and taking the same position for a later delivery date. This is a good strategy. But in some cases, especially for a company like Metal Shark, which we could uh, read as a case study uh, anywhere, they have followed a similar kind of a strategy, but they have run into difficulties because the price of the commodity has declined drastically, which has resulted in huge amount of cash flow liquidity the timing 
of the cash is what has created a big problem for them. The margin requirements that came out has resulted in a cash flow crisis for them, liquidity problems which could not be handled. Now, in some cases, uh, even those kind of problems are bound to occur. We have to really critically evaluate the strategy. But whenever we, we are of the intention that our, uh, our asset needs to be held for a longer period, but we have the future contracts available for a shorter period, then the appropriate strategy in that case is a stack and roll kind of a strategy itself. Right. So this is where uh, we come to the end of this uh, session. We have understood the basic principles, the long hedge, the short hedge, the reasons why we go for hedging, the arguments against the hedging. We talked about the basis risk, cross hedging. How do we find out uh, the optimal hedge ratio, number of contracts to be hedged? In case I am using the stock index futures, how do I really hedge using them? And finally, talked about the concept of stack and roll strategy. All right.